Hello and good morning, everyone. Still morning? Yeah. Well, Fei Long and I are from New Zealand, and uh, in New Zealand right now it's 11:50 p.m. Uh, I just arrived a, a couple of days ago, so if I feel a bit jet lagged, uh, you guys will certainly understand what I'm going through here. Um, look, it's uh, excellent to be here with you all. Uh, very nice uh, to see a bunch of familiar faces in the audience and meet you all again. Um, this is my friend Fei Long. My name is Bruno. Uh, we work for a company called Catalyst Cloud, and we are a public cloud provider uh, down in New Zealand on the little corner of the world map. Sometimes I just learned that people leave New Zealand out of the world map. So there is a bit of a movement going on in New Zealand asking people to reintroduce New Zealand to the world map in case. So please check your books. Uh, and, and if we're missing there, please add us again. Um, we run three public cloud regions in New Zealand, one in um, Hamilton, one in Porirua, one in Wellington, right? Three separate regions completely isolated from each other. Uh, each one with one availability zone and different means for high availability. Um, the topic of our presentation today uh, is a bit of a journey that we've been um, going on for about a year or a year and a half, I would say. One year. Almost one year. Um, and this is about us introducing uh, New Zealand's first certified uh, Kubernetes platform service uh, running on top of OpenStack. With the, uh, when, when we're talking about the certification, we're talking about the certification done by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and making sure that the Kubernetes offering on top of OpenStack uh, passes all the API tests to certify that, OpenStack, uh, that Kubernetes works as expected, um, but also to guarantee application portability, right? One of the biggest benefits that our customers in New Zealand are looking for when running Kubernetes is really that guaranteed application portability between public cloud providers. A lot of our customers uh, have, you know, are mostly targeting uh, their, their customers based in New Zealand, but some of them are also exporting their services to other countries. They have a presence in Australia, they have a presence in Europe. Uh, and what we really want to do for them is to allow them to use any public cloud provider and so long that public cloud provider has a CNCF certified Kubernetes offering that they have through application portability between cloud providers, right? To me, that's uh, the biggest, one of the biggest benefits of uh, Kubernetes. Uh, it is that real dream of true application portability that I think as cloud providers, many of us have missed at that infrastructure as a service layer uh, with APIs that are not always compatible. Maybe for us in the room, that's excellent because we all run OpenStack, I hope. Um, and we have a degree of portability. Uh, but when I'm talking to customers in New Zealand who also have a presence in Australia, maybe with um, Google or Azure or something in Europe, um, they, they really need uh, to make sure that without changing anything at all, their application will just run. So the journey was about making Kubernetes on top of OpenStack production ready. In Pretty much everything that we do at Catalyst, we uh, only use open source software. All the development we do is upstream. Uh, we never retain any of that code for ourselves. There's no secret sauce. There's nothing that we keep for us. Uh, and of course, we also acknowledge the fact that we have uh, gained a lot from the OpenStack and Kubernetes community. Um, so in terms of making uh, Kubernetes production ready, there were four elements that we were taking in consideration. One of them was strong data security. I'll elaborate on, on each one of those later. The other one was high availability and resiliency, good performance and scalability, and finally, easy of use. So when we talk about strong data security, one thing we wanted to make sure is that if customers are using, in, in our case, uh, we, we built a solution using Magnum, and if they are deploying Kubernetes uh, that is being orchestrated by Magnum, we wanted to make sure that Kubernetes could use um, Keystone as its identity uh, and access management provider so that we had role-based access control to Kubernetes using the same username and passwords that people have already created in our public cloud, right? Um, it doesn't, doesn't make much sense if we give them 
uh, the ability to add more users uh, to define roles and permissions in our OpenStack infrastructure if nothing is inherited into Kubernetes itself. And in Kubernetes land, we only gave them an admin username and password. And off they go, and in there they create their own users, uh, et cetera. Um, so the intention here was uh, they should be able to use their Keystone username and password. Not only that, they should have different roles in Keystone. Uh, maybe an admin role, a developer role where you can create containers, and a read-only role, right? And um, um, th that was part of the work that was done um, by Fei Long and a few other pe uh, people in the community. And that integration exists now, and it works. And there was a post by a friend of us uh, called Ling Shen on the um, OpenStack Super User blog, where he explains that integration step by step. And there is a bit of a demo there showing how that works. I highly recommend reading that, that blog post, by the way. Um, the next one is, when in, in New Zealand, we also help customers to run private clouds. right? We uh, actually don't, don't sell OpenStack as a product. Uh, we allow them to run OpenStack uh, from upstream, but we manage that private cloud infrastructure for them as if it was one of our regions. We use the same software, the same team of people, the same experience that we um, developed over the last five years running a public cloud based on OpenStack. We apply that to their private cloud infrastructure. And from a lot of our private cloud customers, one of their biggest requests was network policies inside Kubernetes, right? Um, for those of you that are not familiar with network policies, they are akin to security groups in OpenStack, where you're pretty much saying, this pod can talk to that pod, right? Uh, but using the native Kubernetes constructs. Um, and to implement network policies, you need a, a network backend that supports uh, network policies. And uh, work that Fei Long has done uh, recently is to introduce support for Calico in Magnum, so when you deploy Kubernetes with, with Magnum now, you have, uh, in, in our case, it's the default choice on the Catalyst Cloud. You use the Calico network backend. And with the Calico network backend, you have support for network policies. Um, I'll skip ahead a little bit. Uh, that, that will touch a bit on performance later. But another reason for uh, using Calico is because when we ran some tests with the default uh, flannel network overlay that Magnum was using, um, just to give you an idea in terms of performance, we were doing a test where uh, from a hypervisor to another hypervisor, we were getting 6.5 gigabits per second of network performance. Um, when we did the same test from a pod to another pod, that performance dropped to 400 megabits per second, right? We were losing a lot of our network performance um, with the standard setup that came out of uh, Magnum. So part of the work that Fei Long was doing as well with the implementation of Calico was to make sure that the network performance was as close as possible to the uh, neutral networks, right? And after doing that work, I believe we've got to something like 6.3 gigabits per second, which was very, very close to the maximum performance we were getting from the hypervisors themselves. And at that point, we said, this is good. That this will scale, right? So those were the two reasons for choosing Calico as a network backend. Um, and finally, a feature that is really important uh, if we are managing hundreds of Kubernetes clusters on behalf of customers is rolling upgrades and patching, right? We need to make sure that we can keep on patching that Kubernetes infrastructure uh, and that we can do uh, major upgrades as well. So this is a feature that is still being actively developed upstream. Um, uh, Yep. Sverus from CERN is working on that, and I think the patch is currently is in good shape. Probably uh, could be merged in, in this release. Yep. So in our case, uh, we are currently working with the uh, Kubernetes service in tech preview with our customers. So we made it clear to them uh, that currently, if you uh, deploy Kubernetes, you'll be stuck on that version. Uh, we don't have the ability yet to upgrade uh, to the next major release, or easily upgrade to the ne next major release. And it's one of the features that we are waiting for before we can uh, call that service beta and start engaging a bit more with customers on more serious workloads. Now, the next one is uh, high availability and resiliency, right? When we looked at Magnum originally, the concept of highly available master nodes and highly available worker nodes was not present yet, right? Uh, and, of course, if we want customers to run something serious on top of this Kubernetes offering, 
we need to make sure that if a single hypervisor goes down, that it doesn't take multiple master nodes or multiple worker nodes down at the same time, right? Uh, in the case of the master nodes, that's because you have an HCG cluster and, and a bunch of uh, things in there that rely on, heavy, uh, rely on having a certain number of nodes present to be available. And in the case of the worker nodes, if customers are deploying something where they say, uh, I would like a replica set of X, uh, they don't expect that a single virtual machine uh, being affected by an incident to impact their application, right? So Fei Long did some work on that as well. Uh, and now there is support in Magnum for highly available master nodes. Uh, when you do that, it creates a load balancer in front of those master nodes, and that load balancer, it's another feature introduced there with uh, support for Octavia using OpenStack um, native load balancer. And also for the uh, worker nodes, what we've done is, by the way, what we've done is just use at the moment the um, server groups with anti-affinity. So the master nodes, they are in an anti-affinity server group, and the worker nodes are in a separate anti-affinity server group, right? Uh, there is some work being discussed with Spiros from CERN as well in terms of adding support for availability zones so that you can use different availability zones to isolate the master nodes, right? Um, and finally, a feature that we are currently working on uh, is auto-healing. So the idea that uh, the, you guys probably know that Magnum uses heat uh, and, and orchestration templates, heat orchestration templates to deploy Kubernetes and manage Kubernetes. Uh, at that point, heat has got a feature to do health checks on your master nodes, on your worker nodes, and the intent there is that we'll have those health checks going on all the time, uh, regularly, and if we detect that a given master node or a given worker node is not healthy, that we would rebuild that node as fast as possible, right, just to keep the, the uh, service always available, always in shape. Now, in terms of performance and scalability, I have already touched on network performance, uh, but the other one was storage performance. And to our benefit here, there wasn't much we had to do in, in this space. So Magnum um, already supported that integration between uh, Kubernetes and Cinder. So if a, if a customer is asking for a persistent volume, is doing a persistent volume claim, uh, there was already support for Cinder to create that volume and that volume to be attached uh, to the pod that needs that persistent volume. And based on our tests, the performance that you were getting there, as expected, is pretty much the raw performance that you get out of the volume if you were mounting that same volume on the virtual machine. So that was pretty good. I don't think we did any changes to that, have we? Cool. Um, so a thing that we're working on right now is the time it takes to deploy the Kubernetes clusters. Um, we went live really early with, with the Kubernetes service on, on the Catalyst Cloud. Uh, in, in New Zealand, as far as I can tell, we're definitely the first public cloud provider to offer a Kubernetes uh, platform. Um, but I know that even in Australia, some of the um, global public cloud providers don't have Kubernetes available yet on their clouds in Australia, right? So we went live really early on, and that's because we wanted to encourage a quite close feedback loop with our New Zealand customers, so we could understand what they need and how we can shape that service uh, to fit uh, our unique needs there in New Zealand. And I guess the trade-off there is that in the process of doing so, we produced our uh, images, our container uh, images upstream, uh, and they are currently on uh, Docker Hub. They are using the OpenStack uh, upstream infrastructure. But what it means is that every time a customer is deploying their Kubernetes cluster in New Zealand, currently they are going all the way to uh, whatever um, Docker Hub is hosting their images uh, and back to New Zealand, and that takes a long time. Right? It's one of the issues that we have being um, so far away from, from other places is that network latency is uh, a big deal in, in our country. And the, the result of that is that currently it takes, if you're deploying uh, what we call the development Kubernetes template, uh, which has uh, one master node and one worker node, that's taking about five minutes to deploy. But if you're doing the production template, which has three worker nodes at least and three master nodes at least, that's currently taking 15 minutes to deploy. Um, and, and honestly, that feels like ages nowadays, right? Um, it, it is 
several coffees for some people. So we definitely want to reduce that to uh, no more than five minutes, ideally three minutes, right? We're being realistic here. We know that we are deploying uh, and building all those uh, master nodes uh, when, when customers ask to provision Kubernetes. Um, but in parts, the, the process of doing so is actually uh, making sure that we have a local Docker registry uh, and a few optimizations that we want to do that would make the whole bootstrapping process faster. Uh, and finally, when it comes to horizontal scalability, uh, there is a feature that we haven't worked on yet, uh, and I'm really interested to know if anyone here is actively working on it, and that's the ability for Kubernetes uh, to add additional worker nodes um, based on its own knowledge of um, the capacity of the cluster, right? So Kubernetes is aware of how many pods we have deployed, uh, what resources are being currently utilized, and it could tell us hey, I cannot schedule pods anymore because I ran out of compute resources, right? So the intention there is to say, when I get to 80%, add another worker node on my behalf. Uh, and customers can put a limit to that on how many additional worker nodes could I, could I add. So this is a feature that is uh, still being developed. To, to be more clear, currently in Magnum, you can uh, scale up or down manually, but Bruno yeah. is mostly talking about auto uh, auto, yeah, auto auto scaling as opposed okay. to someone going there it's absolutely possible for people to go in there do a single api call and say go from three worker nodes to 10 worker nodes or back to three that's easy right what i'm talking about is the proper auto scaling where kubernetes itself is adding more compute capacity as needed um, and finally the last one is uh, easy of use so um, the patterns that we're motivating people to use in New Zealand are definitely to you know, drive, drive it via the APIs, uh, use your preferred uh, infrastructure uh, DevOps tools to, to drive your cloud infrastructure. Uh, and our customers over there, they really enjoy using Terraform, they really enjoy using Ansible. Those are the two primary tools that most of our customers use in production. So part of the work that we've been doing is to introduce that support to um, Magnum APIs, in this case, to Terraform and Ansible. So Fei Long developed a, a module. Probably for most of the work uh, have done is for Ansible, and I think most of the work for Terraform uh, has been done by um, Blizzard. Oh, yeah, true. Blizzard, yeah. Blizzard did the work on Terraform, yes. which is wonderful, right? It's all about that international collaboration that we want to see happening on, on this stuff. Um, and Finally, the last one that I want to touch on easy of use is the close integration with the OpenStack infrastructure layer, right? So what we have learned in while running Kubernetes uh, deployed by ourselves, not by Magnum in, in the Catalyst Cloud uh, for the last two or three years is that what makes Kubernetes really awesome on a public cloud environment is that it can actually orchestrate actions on the infrastructure layer on your behalf. So let me give you one example. If you go to Kubernetes and you say, I would like an ingress controller for my application, you expect that Kubernetes will create a load balancer in OpenStack for you. Not only that, you expect that Kubernetes will create the layer seven uh, routing rules in that load balancer on your behalf for that application, right? So part of the work we've been doing is, uh, and that was also work by, done by Ling Shen, I'm not sure if Ling Shen is in the audience here, but part of what we've been doing is to work on the cloud provider for OpenStack with the Kubernetes community so that there is better and broader um, support for all the OpenStack services, right? So just a quick um, explanation of how far that work uh, has, has been done so far. Uh, the load balancing integration with Octavia um, is pretty solid right now. Uh, as I said, uh, with block storage, it was already solid when, when we touched it. With object storage, in case customers want to use object storage as their registry, their, their container registry for, for their images, that is pretty good as well. Uh, virtual machines for additional worker nodes, all done. The network integration with Neutron, um, it's solid. And finally, the integration with Keystone for um, access control. Um, there, will be, there will be probably more touch points later, but what we wanted was that really um, smooth integration between Kubernetes and OpenStack, right? Um, now, would you like to cover next steps? Yeah, as Bruno mentioned, we are uh, using Magnum, OpenStack Magnum. So, um, we, we, 
we are talking about the production ready journey, but as you can see, it's still not really. Um, so I mean, there's still some work need to be uh, improved. So for upstream, what we would do, need to do next is um, the health check and auto healing. Bruno mentioned there is uh, one solution use um, the, the heat health check, and there is another solution we are talking about is using um, the node problem detector plus um, the, the Drino and uh, autoscaler to, to fix the, uh, the Kubernetes cluster automatically. And uh, the rolling upgrades. And for resource cleanup on deletion, uh, that one is a little bit tricky. Uh, <laughs> we, we have seen some customer complain, open tickets for us, uh, I can't delete our uh, Kubernetes cluster. It's because user has created um, load balancer, load balancer service on top of uh, Kubernetes cluster. But um, Magnum has no idea which one, because the, the load balancer is, cre is created in the same network. And Magnum has no idea uh, which load balancer I, I can delete. We have, currently, we have a solution for that. But that probably needs uh, a chart pick in Kubernetes from, from current master branch to, I think, v1.11.12, no, not 12, 5. Uh, and we have tested working. So, yeah, probably could happen in the next couple of weeks or months, I don't know. Yeah, just to be clear on that one, we already have some code that is doing that cleanup. Um, it will probably evolve. It's just a starting point. But at least now, Kubernetes can tag whatever resources it created, saying this belongs to this specific um, Magnum cluster with the IG there, so that later on it can clean up prior to deleting the, the resources. Yeah, and the next one is the ingress controller integration with uh, Design It. Uh, we, as Bruno mentioned, we have done some work uh, for the Octavia ingress controller. And probably the next um, big item is integration with design. And that's for upstream. For downstream, for Catalyst specific, um, we probably need a dedicated container registry. Currently, we're still using Docker Hub in, yeah, for performance issue. Yeah, we need a dedicated one just for, for Catalyst Cloud. And, um, Another one is dedicated discovery service. Because uh, in Magnum, the default discovery service is the discovery.etcd.io. And that one is not designed for production use, just for demo. And the maintainer is, um, is talking. It's not really actively maintained. So we probably need um, at least deployed um, a local version for that one because there is a container image for that to deploy it, dedicate for, for Catalyst Cloud. And we probably uh, propose a patch in Magnum so Magnum can support a, a cluster, at least a list of a discovery service. So by default, you can use uh, the public one. And if the public one is done, you can just use another one in the list. Uh, and we also need um, a pipeline, an automated pipeline, to quick create, test, and release the whole um, the whole work. That one needs to be done as soon I think as soon as possible. It's that one is a bit tricky uh, because recently we we ran into a problem in in Kubernetes v1.11 uh, with that. With, with that release, you're probably losing the, the internal and external IP address for your uh, worker nodes. That's a bug in Kubernetes, and it has been cherry picked to, it's, it's fixed in v1.12, but it has been really merged in v1.11. Yeah. Yeah. And this one is quite important, right? It's not that we are planning to have our own internal pipeline where we have stuff that hasn't been developed upstream. It's just about the velocity that we need. Uh, if there is a critical bug or if there is a critical security issue, what yeah. we have found is that in trying to work with the Kubernetes community upstream, 
something that was really critical took too long um, to, to be merged and to be uh, uh, available for us to use. So uh, we'll definitely need to have that ability just to make sure that if there's something critical, we get it sorted as quickly as possible while we are working uh, upstream to get those, those images sorted upstream, yeah. right? Yeah, we would like to use as much as possible the, the upstream public Always. images as possible. But for some case, you think the bug is critical, but the reviewer thing is not critical. So, yeah. yeah. Look, we, we are very, very aware of producing or running any code that we haven't developed upstream and, and um, merged upstream first, right? We are very aware of that risk. Yeah. Uh, we very rarely do that with OpenStack itself. Uh, sometimes it's needed, and what we've learned is that the same thing is needed for Kubernetes, right? Um, but we are not going to use that bullet very often, hopefully. Yeah. Sorry. So there are some tips, uh, like lesson learned. Uh, we learned from the, the technical preview when we run Magnum. So currently there are some limitation. So don't use overlay or overlay tool as the, uh, the storage, Docker storage driver with um, Docker volume side. So with that combination, you'll probably run into some problem. Uh, and the problem is you can't create any container. So if you want to use overlay or overlay tool, just leave the, the Docker volume size as empty. And another one is uh, limitation. We have mentioned that Magnum is not aware of the resources created by Kubernetes. But I think it should be fixed in the next couple of weeks. And there is a bug, yeah, I just mentioned. And you can take a look um, in Cloud Provider OpenStack issues um, 280 for more details. And the versions. Um, I would suggest uh, using Magnum Loki, but at least use um, Magnum Queens. And for heat, I would suggest use uh, stable Queens as well because there is a multi region problem, multi region bug in heat. Mm -hmm. So if you don't use that, yeah, it doesn't work for, yeah, if you are running a multi region. Uh, so that, that was a pretty interesting one for us to learn, right? Um, because as a public cloud provider, like many of you, we have a pre-production environment. Now, in our case, one of the current limitations we have with our pre-production environment is that we cannot fully um, em emulate yet the, the actual behavior that we have with three production regions in, in New Zealand. And the interesting thing is, uh, up to pre-production, whatever work we've done with Magnum and Kubernetes was working really well, and as soon as we roll out to production, this bug can, comes up, right? Magnum doesn't work with multiple regions, and that's because of a bug in heat. So that was a very interesting surprise because, uh, to be honest, we thought there were uh, people already running uh, Magnum uh, and Kubernetes in multiple regions before, so we were surprised that we were the first ones to stumble on that bug and have to yeah. fix it. Um, but it's sorted now. Yeah. Um, just use the latest version. Yeah. So that's all. Is any question? If you could use the microphone for the recording, that would be good. So you mentioned the integration between uh, Kubernetes and uh, Keystone. Yeah. And with a solution by Fang, I think. Yeah. And, and the solution by? That you, you mentioned the, the blog from Fang, Fang, I think. And we did a little bit further, went a little bit further, because instead of using passwords, we introduced the application credentials, which yeah. is the new features in, yeah, yeah. in Pike. Yeah. Yeah, so absolutely. we produced a, a, an upgrade to the Gopher Cloud library, so you yeah. can use the Cube KCL, Cube Control, with, mm -hmm. the, with the application credentials. Yeah. So you can create your own application credential and use yeah. them to, 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 I mean, to deploy applications yeah. on Kubernetes without going through passwords. Because absolutely. we don't use passwords, we use uh, federated authentication, so we have no... Understood, reason. understood. So, the, the important thing is the work we've done is pretty clean in terms of the interfaces used. Uh, we're just using the, the Keystone API, and if you have a valid token, 
be from uh, an application or from a regular user with username and password, that valid token will be accepted so long it has one of the roles that give you access to Magnum, right? And, and in our case, there are three different roles, as I said, mm -hmm. admin, uh, developer, and read-only, right? But there's no reason, as far as I can tell, why application credentials wouldn't work. Uh, actually, that's also something that we would like to do. Okay. We very much want to move yeah, on to, to the to next that. version of, of Keystone to use application credentials. Thank you. Um, in our case, just to let you know, there is a presentation being done by a friend of mine called Adrian uh, on a new OpenStack project that just became part of the, the uh, official OpenStack projects recently called Edutent. Um, and Edutent is something that for us as a public cloud provider uh, helps us to streamline business process workflows, right? I'll broadly say business process workflows. So what I mean by that is a customer signing up, a customer terminating their account, a customer inviting someone else to join their project in OpenStack, and that process of sending the email with a, a, a link to validate their email that expires automatically and so on. Uh, Edutent will automate these workflows. Uh, and the interesting thing in our case is that via Edutent, our customers can already create fake application uh, credentials, right? Uh, it's not that it's a clean feature, like proper application credentials, but they definitely have the ability to create additional accounts that they can use for applications only. And they have the ability to say, this application account has got only this role. So it's not that we are as impacted uh, as you probably are, uh, because we are running Edutent, uh, but we certainly want to use application credentials as well. Uh, had you considered uh, using Curl Kubernetes, which is CNI plugin that is using Neutron to network pods? I'm not sure if I'm familiar with it. Okay, so it's it's an OpenStack project. Uh... Are you familiar with it? Which one? Courier. Courier. Ah, ah Courier. Yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. I, I just didn't understand. Yes, I have. Uh, actually, we have yeah. uh, very much so. Um, okay, so we got in touch with the Courier community. Um, this was about a year ago, right, when we went uh, when we were going this journey. And I don't know if you remember, but a big feature for us or for our customers was uh, network policies, right? Okay. And network policies were already fully supported by Calico when we uh, started doing this work. Um, not to mention that in the Calico community, what we have found was about, were about 50 developers that were really active working on Calico, right? And developers from multiple companies, the sort of healthy open source collaboration that we want to see. Lots of developers from multiple companies truly looking at it as an independent project. And we didn't find that same level of traction or agility in Courier. Um, I understand that there are some things we could do even better with Courier because the, the integration would be even closer to OpenStack itself. Uh, but a year ago, it was not ready, right? Uh, I, one of the things I want to do at the conference this time is to check how Career is doing, go to the uh, uh, update session there. Yeah, we have it uh, today at uh, yep. 220, I think. And, and the intention is to understand how far we, do we have the features that we need. Uh, and at that point, it's pretty much looking at the templates and introducing it. Because uh, one of the nice things with Magnum is that you have uh, um, flags that you can pass saying, I would like to use this network backend. And currently, we, we pass that with uh, Calico. But we could, there's nothing preventing us to say, use Courier and introduce support for Courier in parallel. And then if that becomes better than the Calico backend, we can switch to Courier later, right? Thank you. But it has been considered. And I would love, you know. Hi. Uh, did you encounter some troubles by implementing high availability using Octavia? With Octavia specifically? Yeah, specifically with Octavia. Look, I guess first the first part of the question, have mm -hmm. we found some troubles? We found all the troubles you can imagine. <laughs> Lots of troubles. Uh, but, but it's part of the journey, uh, and it's something that we really like at Catalyst, right? We are trailing that you know, bleeding edge software and, and doing things that people haven't done before. So if you're not finding troubles and if you're not solving them as fast as you can, uh, then you're probably not doing something that is worth your time. Um, now, specific issues with Octavia for high availability. Uh, yeah, yeah, there was one bug. There was one bug that is probably uh, worthy to mention. It has been fixed, 
already. Uh, but there was a bug where uh, Octavia lost its connection um, to the MySQL backend. And when it lost that connection, it said, hey, I don't know the state of these enforas, so I'll just uh, recreate them or delete them. And in the process of recreating them, uh, both enforas became completely unavailable. And at that point, the load balancer just stopped working for the customer impacted, right? Um, in untangling that bug, we found some things that really needed to be improved in Octavia. Uh, for example, Octavia was actually deleting the uh, load balancer information from the database instead of marking it as deleted so that we could go back and reconstruct that load balancer with whatever uh, it was done before. Um, but all of that has been fixed already. Uh, and if you're running from stable or from, from master, you shouldn't be affected by those bugs. But other than this one bug, no, we haven't encountered um, more so far. And if you have something you can share with us to prevent us from hitting. So, uh, I, as far as I know, uh, Octavia is just uh, one VM using, uh, using a, um, a load balancing technology. No. But, yeah. No, 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 no. Okay. okay. Octavia is not just using one VM, right? It depends how you set up Octavia. If you set up Octavia properly, it will deploy multiple virtual machines. In our case, with the load balancing service on the Catalyst Cloud, we deploy at least two virtual machines. Two so you, you, you are using a, a dedicated load balancer uh, on top of that? A dedicated? A dedicated load balancer technology on top of that. No, no, no. no. Uh, it is just a, no, no dedicated load balancer, no external hardware. It's all implemented in software. It's all Octavia, open source. All the work we've done is always using uh, native OpenStack software, right? So Octavia is deploying two Anforas. The Anforas have uh, HA proxy running in mm. them. Uh, and it sets a high availability, uh, again, server group anti-affinity, so mm -hmm. they don't end up in the same hypervisor. Uh, and it creates, uh, I believe it's using uh, Keep Alive G to create a cluster mm -hmm. between at least two of these VMs, so it's highly available. So we can actually lose one of the load balancers and, and it will continue working as expected, right? So okay. that's why I'm saying no high availability issues with Octavia. In yeah. this regard, but by using Keep Alive, you 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 succeed in uh, in load balancing, uh, load yeah. balancing the technologies. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. It's pretty pretty solid. Yeah. 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 The, yeah. The, the the bugs that we found in Octavia were su more subtle than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Hello. Yep. Hi. Uh, I want low. I want to know uh, which kind of ecosystem tools. Uh, uh, but the catalyst the cloud users use to provide and delete the resource in the cloud. So, so you, I, I'm not sure if I understand the question. When you say which ecosystem, are you talking about a specific OpenStack yeah, flavor some, or distribution? Yeah, I think something, some tools like Turbon or OpenShift or Ansible or something like that. Uh, in, in our case, uh, as yeah. I said before, code that we are running is vanilla OpenStack from upstream. It's yeah. not a distribution from any vendor. The Kubernetes code that we're running is vanilla Kubernetes from upstream, not a distribution from any vendor, right? OK. And, and you, you mentioned, I uh, say you, uh, you developed the Ansible module and uh, the Turbon provider for the Catalyst Cloud. Yeah. That's all for upstream, all upstream. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, Low and upstream. It, it, all upstream. All upstream. Yes. All upstream. It's not for the Catalyst Cloud specific, right? Yeah. The Terraform okay. and the Ansible modules that were created in this journey, they are actually OpenStack modules, not okay. Catalyst Cloud modules. Okay. It oh. turns out that the Catalyst Cloud runs on OpenStack, so if you use the OpenStack modules, it will work with the Catalyst Cloud, right? But the work that we've done there, you guys can use in any OpenStack Cloud. Okay, understood. Thank you. No Thank problem. You. Um, I'll just assume that we have time to, you know, until someone interrupts me and says that we no longer have time, but so. Carry on. Uh, Questions? OK, so uh, maybe a quick question. Uh, you mentioned that you uh, don't really support upgrading the Kubernetes cluster because it's uh, challenging as of now. Yeah. So is, it isn't uh, easily upgradable. It uh, is. A, a, so the question is, uh, it's challenging to upgrade the Kubernetes cluster. Um, it's not that challenging, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you're running with multiple masters and multiple worker nodes, one of the nice things about Kubernetes is that it is, it is truly a stateless application. Right? So you can actually uh, queue one worker node at a time and roll the new version uh, of Kubernetes there. Uh, and you could also do the same for the master nodes. 
Um, the, the process that we're going through, and, and by the way, uh, behind the scenes, that's running uh, Fedora Atomic uh, Compute Instance, where we deploy a bunch of uh, Docker containers that contain all the Kubernetes components that we're deploying, right? So it's extremely easy to upgrade. What we are doing is the coding Magnum and the coding Heesh that actually allows you to orchestrate that upgrade process in a way that will not take applications that customers are running on top of Kubernetes down as we are rolling the upgrade, right? And that orchestration is about taking one master node down at a time, one worker node down at a time, and as you reintroduce them back to the cluster, making sure that they are healthy and making sure that they are working as expected, right? And at that point, if the applications deployed by customers have a replica set of two or more, then their applications shouldn't go down as they do the upgrade. And one, nice re one really nice thing with the upgrade process is that's going to be a very simple API call where customers can trigger the upgrade themselves and they can say, I would like to go to this version of Kubernetes, right? Uh, very similar to the way uh, people are doing um, that with the Google Container Engine. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you. I just wanted to ask, uh, you mentioned that um, uh, integration with Sender for persistent volumes is pretty unproblematic. Uh, do you have a need for RWX read, write, many storage as well? Um, um, do, do we have a need for? For, for read, write, many RWX storage as well. So, so where you have multiple writers uh, to the you same mean multiple, volume. multiple things writing to the same volume. Yeah, it is just curious, is that anything that uh, no. comes up uh, so with far the that need, so far? So far the need uh, of uh, volumes that are mounted in multiple compute instances uh, and exposed to multiple pods at the same time. Uh, that hasn't come up uh, with our customers. Um, interesting because I tend to think about that as a not so good pattern for applications that are running on top of Kubernetes. I would expect them to use storage in a different way. Um, but no, because we don't have a, that need, uh, we haven't um, seen that problem or we don't know if that's supported. Right? At this point, because Kubernetes is just asking Cinder for a volume, I assume that if your cloud already has support for uh, volumes that can be mounted to multiple compute instances, that that would work, right? Because it's just using the standard Cinder API and the Cinder interface. So um, um, block devices aren't going to give you that. Uh, if you do have that need, um, and there are some design patterns, I think, where, where it does come up, uh, yeah. For instance, if you have uh, containers collecting data and, and writing them to a common area that then gets aggregated. Yeah. Um, so uh, Manila can fill that role, complementing exactly. complementing sender. Exactly. Um, and um, I just here is uh, Manila PTL to point that out. So if it comes yeah, up, yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, you know, um, that, that's, a, that's a good fit. So um, and uh, Manila has... Um, um, since it serves up, it doesn't serve up storage via a hypervisor. It just serves it over the network, so it doesn't care if it's bare metal or container or whatever that's I'm consuming aware. it. So just you know, keep it Look, in mind. Uh, that, that's what I was going to say. When you, when you phrased the question originally talking about Cinder, the reason I said that's a pattern that I wouldn't encourage people to do is because if we were approaching that with customers, the first call would be, can your application use object storage? And if their application cannot use object storage, then it would be a Manila network file right. system. And, um, right, you, and you, the other aspect is you need, right, for, for the case for Manila would be that you need random access rather than yeah. working with the whole yeah. object coming in and out. Yeah. And, um, so just, just, just checking, calibrating our... And because of your interest in Manila, uh, we, we have plans to roll Manila on the Catalyst Cloud as well. We run Ceph as our uh, storage backend for block storage. Uh, and with CephFS, we pretty much have a pretty decent backend sure. for Manila Ceph as well. CephFS, and then we have an NFS front-end uh, CephFS as well. Exactly, um, exactly. So, cool. Uh, look, I'm pretty Thank sure you. we are over uh, time now. Thank you for all the questions. It was very interesting hearing your questions. Thank you for having us.